Welcome to Colonial Church Worship Online. My name is Aaron Roberts, and I am so glad that you are connecting to Worship God today. We are relaunching in-person worship here at Colonial Church after over a year of worshiping exclusively online. I am now fully vaccinated, and I am looking so forward to our relaunch. And I wanted to give you a little heads up about what to expect as we begin to come together again. First off, just like everyone else in public, masks and social distancing are necessary. And we'll have a vocalist who will be singing our hymns too, so we won't all be singing out together at first. In each pew, we're kind of going minimalist. And so you're going to see QR codes that you can scan with a smartphone to fill out a connection card or make an offering. And rather than pass offering plates, there's going to be an offering plate outside the sanctuary so that you can put prayer request cards or make donations with that. Children won't be coming forward for children's conversation at first either. And our nursery and children's Sunday school won't be in operation until this summer as we restart and we train our workers. And we also need to get that space in our church building ready and safe again. We are planning to have our vacation Bible school program for kids this summer, though. So save the dates of July 6th through the 9th. Our hope is to begin offering nursery care in June with Sunday school then beginning after VBS. Holy Communion will be offered by coming forward. We'll be distanced a little bit, so we're kind of asking people to space out. And you're going to be receiving these sealed communion kits. And, and for a while yet, coffee and conversation, Sunday morning classes and meetings will remain online. Our relaunched worship services are going to be different. The world changed this past year. And over the next few months, we're going to continue to adapt following CDC guidelines. Our community lost people to COVID. Some people who have gone to the Lord this past year didn't receive a service to honor their life and resurrection. So on Saturday, July 10th, after these United States celebrate our Independence Day from the pandemic, we will be having a COVID memorial service to come together to do that, to remember and honor. And the plans are already afoot. They have a big party for our gathering Sunday celebration in September. I can't tell you more about it than that, but it's going to be good. God has guided us through dark days, and now, by that same grace, we move into better days. Also, we're going to delay our recording of the Jerusalem dance until Sunday, May 23rd. That's Pentecost Sunday. And we're going to come together out in the Circle Drive that Sunday, and we're going to record ourselves then. If you are worshiping from home and would like to submit yours, please have it to us by that following Monday, which would be the 24th. You can find out ways about how to participate with our church community in our small groups and how this community lives out its call to be a blessing in our crier newsletters. And if you have a joy or a concern that you would like to share with this church's prayer ministry, you can send that prayer to the email address that's on screen now. Also, please let us know that you participated in worship with us today. We have connection cards, and if you fill those out, it gives you a chance for us to know who is participating, but also to reach out to you if you're new to our community. The link to doing that is on screen now as well. Easter is the unstoppable, unpredictable expression of God's love for humankind. The call of Jesus is to live fully in the power of that love alive in each of us. We learn about the divine love as it is embodied in the person and the ministry of Jesus, the one who is compared to a good shepherd. 
As we look to him to learn how to love, may our hearts praise the one who raised Jesus and raised us into abundant life and love. If we are to dance with abandon, we learn and follow, then we can begin to lead. We can learn the steps to the dance of love through the lead of Jesus and those who have gone before us. May we dare to dance even as we continue to learn the way of love. This is the call. We lean into this day with the strength we have. We lift up our heads to meet the day. God sends out a call and that will not let us go. We fortify our hearts with compassion and action. If rain still lingers, open the umbrellas in love and step out anyway. For we are called to dance again. Our hymn today is They'll know we are Christians. We're not hugging or shaking hands quite yet, but wherever you are right now, whether you have the chat feature or worshiping together, just take a moment now to acknowledge the other people who are worshiping with you.
let the dreamers sing their song. Dare to dance their stories, sing out strong. Dare to dance their freedom your whole life long. Dare to dance again. Good morning, boys and girls. It is so good to see you on this spring day, and I have my spring Easter umbrella. Now, you may have heard about the dreamer we're going to talk about today. She isn't much older than some of you. Her name is Greta Thunberg. Greta is from Sweden, and her biggest dream is, to, is that the leaders of the world will take action to stop or slow down climate change and take care of our planet. This week is Earth Day. It's on April 22nd, and it began in 1970. At that time, students in colleges were protesting the Vietnam War, and in 1969, there was a big oil spill in California, and one of the professors thought, we should get these students to organize for saving our planet. So in 1970, was the first Earth Day. Mm -hmm. And they had it in April because the students were done with spring break, but before finals. And that's how they settled on that date. 20 years later, 1990, Earth Day went global. And 200 million people uh, in 141 countries worked to save our planet. Today, Earth Day is the largest secular, which means non-religious observation in the world with more than one billion people spending a day of action to bring consciousness to the people about the plight of our earth. Now, I wanna show you, this is kind of like a plug, but I watched this documentary and it's called The Year the Earth Changed and it's on Apple TV Plus. It's a 48 minute show about how our earth was changed in the, the animals on our earth this past year when we've had the pandemic. It's really good. Now, back to Greta. Have any of you had any bad dreams? They're really awful when you get them. Well, Greta had some bad dreams that no one was going to do anything about climate change. So she started talking about those fears and trying to make a difference with her dreams of a healthy environment. She shared her dreams with her parents and then made signs and stood outside government buildings trying to share her dreams with decision makers. And she shared it with other children and young people too. Many from all over the world. And stopping climate change became their dream too. Here are some things that Greta said about her dream. I have a dream that the powerful take the climate crisis seriously. At first, I felt like I was the only one who cared about the climate and the ecological crisis. The world is waking up and change is coming. Greta's called for governments around the world to do more to cut emissions. She's pleaded for banks, businesses, and governments to stop investing money in energy sources that damage our environment. She dreams of a time when companies would use their money to restore nature. God calls us all to care for creation. So maybe we could have some dreams like Greta's. Our colorful umbrella has been a sign of joy and hope, even on rainy days, or as this week was, snowy days. Today we add a phrase inspired by Greta to our prayer umbrella. It is, we care. Let's offer a repeat after me prayer. We offer thanks for dreamers true, for all they are and all they do. Let us become dreamers too and bring new life to me and you. Amen. Boys and girls, have a wonderful week and enjoy our wonderful, beautiful earth.
See you later. An angel from the Lord spoke to Philip. At noon, take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he did. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian man was on his way home from Jerusalem, where he had come to worship. He was an eunuch at the, and the official responsible for the treasury of Candace. Candace is the title given to the Ethiopian queen. He was reading the prophet Isaiah while sitting in his carriage. The spirit told Philip, Approach this carriage and stay with it. Running up to the carriage, Philip heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you really understand what you are reading? The man replied, Without someone to guide me, how could I? Then he invited Philip to climb in and sit with him. This was the passage of scripture he was reading. Like a shepherd, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before, his shearer is silent. So he didn't open his mouth. In his, humiliation, in his humiliation, justice was taken away from him. Who can tell the story of his descendants? Because his life was taken from, earth, from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, about whom does the prophet say this? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Starting with that passage, Philip proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. As they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, Look, water! What keeps me from being baptized? Philip said to him, If you believe with all your heart, you can be. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. He ordered that, that the carriage halt. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water where Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Lord's spirit suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. I have never owned a remote-controlled drone of my own, but my now 20-something boys both had them at our home when they were teenagers. And after seeing the ease with which they flew their $50 drones around our backyard, zipping hundreds of feet into the sky, it seemed, before turning earthward only to ease up just in time to avoid crashing into our house, it would have been rather unremarkable as well as highly unlikely for one of those boys to run into the house, eyes dancing with excitement, and have said to me, Dad, you're not going to believe this. I was able to get my drone to hover 10 whole feet off the ground for about 30 seconds and then land it safely right back down from where it took off. <laughs> that wouldn't happen. And my reaction was also rather stoic and unimpressed at first, I'll confess, when I at first heard reporters exclaiming that a small remote-controlled spaceship, drone, helicopter of sorts, had lifted off the surface of the planet Mars this past Monday to a grand total height of 10 feet for about 30 seconds before landing right back in the same place. My reaction was lackluster until I encountered some information that literally shattered my preconceived frame of reference that as silly as it seems at this point was based solely on flying drones in our backyard with my kids. When I learned that because of the time delay in communications, no human being could use a little remote controller joystick from Earth for this mission on Mars, and that they basically used similar technology as seen on self-driving cars for flying itself, and when I learned that after they sent the signal for the tiny little drone, helicopter, spaceship, whatever the tiny little thing is, to perform this 30-second long, 10-foot high mission and then land, and that it was hours later, due to the delay in communications, before those here doing sending the signals for the mission could either confirm or deny whether or not this mission was successful, and when I learned that because the planet Mars's field of gravity is roughly one one hundredth as strong as the Earth's gravity field, and so in landing, this tiny little space helicopter could not so much as bounce at all, or else it would ricochet off the surface of the planet Mars and be flung into the far reaches of outer space, 
But when I learned all of that information, to say the least, my perspective was completely changed. My frame of reference was not the same any longer. And for one fleeting moment in time, when this new information sunk into my oh-so-limited frame of reference, I actually got goosebumps. I prefer to call them God bumps, because it was at that moment that the vastness of the universe and the weight of these incredible achievements of these engineers and scientists who had orchestrated this 30-second, 10-foot-high miracle well, it showed me just how foolish my uninformed and initial reaction was to this bit of news. I won't forget it. Because there was this holy moment, almost a sacred space and place in time where my old ideas, based on my personal but limited experience and information, gave way to something much bigger, much more epic, much more to scale with the rest of of the galaxy. Now in our scripture lesson from Acts today, whether we like it or not, most of us bring with us some ideas and experiences when we read this story. Those of us who've been hanging around churches for a good portion of our lives have probably read this story. We've probably heard sermons about it. Some of us have preached them. And we have some really valuable things we have learned and drawn from this story. One of the best sermons I ever heard on this particular text which was way ahead of its time, was when the legendary late Fred Craddock preached a sermon on this very text called, Can I Also Be Included? And since that sermon, many faithful clergy colleagues have lifted up this story and this text in their own sermons, rightly advocating for the inclusion and equality of LGBTQ plus beloveds within the life of the church. I have given similar sermons on this very text and topic myself in years past. All of my past sermons and all the ones I've heard that were like this, well, they had different points to make along the way. But a shared perspective was quite naturally to kind of take the perspective of Philip when telling the story. You know, the perspective of Christians. I mean, the text was written by Christians, about Christians, for Christians, and distributed among Christians and read today among Christians. I'm not saying any of this is wrong. After all, this is who we are. It's not wrong unless, well, unless we allow our narrow particular perspective to blind us or to prevent us from seeing the stories of others, this one and other stories, from the other person's perspective. Now, according to a rather conventional Christian interpretation of this story of the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, Philip was faithful. Philip was already included. And now, Good old Philip was proving just how inclusive, you know, how progressive, how very open-minded and big-hearted he was. And he offered this poor little black Ethiopian eunuch a chance to get to be a part of the inner circle, the Christian circle, because, well, I mean, God is love, and love is love, and everyone is included. And okay, that last little part love is love, and everyone's included, may not be all that conventional in many Christian cir circles today, sadly enough. But considering who I am preaching to, that part is conventional, at least to us, right? The idea that everyone is equal, and everyone should be treated as such, that everyone is included, that no one is excluded. In many pulpits, that would actually be a prophetic word. Sad enough. But not today. Not for us. That's not prophetic. That's not a stretch. That's not challenging. We're already there. But there's something in this story quite worth wrestling with. We know, according to the story in Acts, that this person was from Ethiopia and that they were a eunuch, one who had been castrated and set apart for the service of a royal official, in this case, Queen Candace. 
And the eunuch had been castrated so that they would not be a sexual threat to the women in the royal circles. So instantly, whether we mean to or not, so often we begin making assumptions that may not be entirely accurate about this eunuch in the story because our perspective is limited about what we know about life 2,000 years after this story. Well, that, and quite frankly, because we like to make ourselves and those most like us, in this case, Philip, the hero of every story. But as the Reverend Dr. Barbara Brown Taylor points out, the Ethiopian was someone wealthy enough to ride in a chariot, educated enough to read Greek, devout enough to study the prophet Isaiah, and humble enough to know that he cannot understand what he is reading without help. He is also hospitable. When Philip speaks to him at the direction of the Holy Spirit, the Ethiopian invites the talkative pedestrian to join him in his chariot. For a modern parallel, Dr. Barbara Brown Taylor says, Imagine a diplomat in Washington, D.C., inviting a street preacher to join him in his late model Lexus for a little Bible study. Now, friends, I'm going to say something here, fully realizing this may be a stretch for some of our perspectives about this story, and for that matter, about the church. Yes, Philip may have baptized this Ethiopian eunuch, but I believe that this black man with a most decidedly non-mainstream, non-heteronormative gender expression and sexual identity, I believe this Ethiopian eunuch just may have saved the church. The eunuch, after all, was the one in a position of power here, not Philip. It was the Ethiopian eunuch that had the wealth, the chariot, the portfolio brimming with all kind of riches. He was already a person of faith, we even find out in our own version of the story. And yet, the Ethiopian eunuch humbly included Philip in his company, a guy who basically a few weeks ago was a stinky, uneducated fisherman. He probably still was rather uneducated, and he probably still stunk like a combination of B.O. and fish guts, for all we know. And yet, the Ethiopian eunuch welcomes him into his fine chariot. Are we so sure Philip was doing the including here in this story? I mean, sure, the eunuch asked to be baptized, and Philip did the baptizing, but who really made this holy moment possible? At the very least, it was a 50-50 partnership, but in my view... I think it's probably more like 90-10, 90% the eunuch's decision, if not more. I would have loved to hear how the eunuch told the story to Queen Candace when he got home to the castle. I bet the eunuch's version of the story sounded a bit different than the one we've told one another for years. I'm not actually sure Christianity would have made it without this eunuch taking his story his experience, the one we have never heard, the way he chose to tell it back home to Queen Candace and the others in high places who had the network to get the word out about this Jesus fellow. And frankly, I'm not sure we'll make it as the church today if we don't pay close attention to the lesson that is staring us squarely in the face from this story. Namely, that straight, even straight, white, progressive Christians are not the hero of everyone else's story, no matter how wonderful we think we are. In fact, the circle doesn't even belong to us that we use to, quote, include others all the time. For this is God's world. This is God's circle and not ours to give. This, now, friends, relax, is not going to be a call-to-action sermon today. When we get done today, I'm not going to ask you to go and do something. I, I'm going to ask you instead to sit still, and I want you to feel something by the time we get done today. 
I want you feel it. I want you to feel it deeply and profoundly. And I hope that we can sit with that feeling when we finish up here long enough to let the feeling soak in deeply enough so that our perspectives have the opportunity to expand. Now, let me be very clear. I, I will not be seeking to invoke guilt, either white guilt or any other kind of guilt. We're not after more guilt because, as we've all witnessed, guilt did not stop, for example, George Floyd from getting murdered in broad daylight in the middle of the street. And guilt won't fix what ails us either. Speaking of George Floyd, I would be remiss if I did not mention this in closing. My social media feeds erupted with many of my white colleagues and friends, including some of you, in, 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 uh, in jubilation over the verdict of the Chauvin trial. As you likely know by now, former officer Chauvin was found guilty on all three charges for the killing of George Floyd. After seeing all the jubilation by so many white folks, and I'll be honest, I, I felt it inside, I noticed many of my black clergy colleagues were relieved in their reactions on social media, but not nearly as overjoyed as my white colleagues and friends. Now, I happen to have a trusted longtime friend and black colleague who is always very patient with me and my whiteness and blindness, who has given me permission time and time again to ask him about these kinds of sensitive matters. And over the years, He's had to speak more than his share of difficult truths to me. So I reached out privately, and I asked him yet again, why was this the case? Why were so many white people so happy, and, and so many of my black colleagues, at least, it seems, so hesitant? He didn't skip a beat. He quickly said, David, did you keep watching the news after the Chauvin verdict was announced? I said, no, I actually had other commitments. Uh, what did I miss? He said, within 30 minutes of the Floyd verdict being announced, a 15-year-old black girl named Makia Bryant was shot and killed by a police officer in Ohio. Yeah, she had a knife and she was in a scuffle with two other girls. But man, he said, white shooters who shoot up shopping malls get captured alive. A teenage girl with a knife in a fight with two other girls, and she gets shot four times and killed? We black folks knew it would happen eventually. We just hoped it would take longer so we could at least get used to the feeling of one court case going the right way for a change. My friends, sometimes... The way I'm telling the story really is great, or the way you're telling the story really is great. And, and sometimes, though, we just think it's great. We just think our story is the only story. Flying $50 remote-controlled drones with my teenage boys in our backyard was really great for making memories as a family. But these flights did nothing to advance the science of space exploration. That doesn't mean flying drones with my kids wasn't important. That was actually priceless time spent with my children. We made some memories. It does, however, point out the fact that I know virtually nothing about flying remote-controlled tiny spacecrafts on Mars. Just like I don't know a thing about being black or brown or gay or transgender, or Jewish, or Muslim, or atheist, or anything about the struggles women face every day. Or any one of a thousand other things, for that matter. This really is the end of the sermon. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I am, however, going to ask you to realize that sometimes the best thing we can do is to educate ourselves on another person's perspective on their story, the way they tell it, not the way we tell it. And to give their story, the way they tell it, the credit it is due. We are not the hero of every story. Not all stories are ours to even tell. But as the prayer of St. Francis puts it, O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console.
To be understood as to understand. I still say the Ethiopian eunuch saved Philip, and maybe even the church. I wonder who has been trying to save us if we weren't so busy being the center of everyone else's universe. May we discover the power of perspective. Amen. Care of creation is literally job number one in our Holy Scriptures. As we recognize Earth Day today, I want to tell you about how back in December, households in our church community were given a, a holiday hundred, a hundred dollars to use to be a blessing to something in the world. Here is a great one. Okay, I didn't see you there. I'm Sophie Carson, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Carson family. My family and I chose to give the $100 to Water.org. Water.org is a Kansas City-based organization that works on projects all over the world to help people get access to clean drinking water. There is more than one reason why this is beneficial. One reason being is that many people all over the world don't have access to clean water, making it so that the water they drink becomes dangerous. It can contain deadly bacteria that can cause severe illness and sometimes even death. Another reason that providing wells and pipelines is a great because without these, women and girls are forced to walk great distances to get fresh water that might not even be that fresh. That can take them all day and be painful on their heads and feet because they carry the water on their heads. It only gets them a small bucket's worth. Also, if girls are spending their whole day walking to get water, they don't have time to go to school. So on behalf of people's health and girls' education, we donate $100. If you are interested in this topic, I highly recommend reading A Long Walk to Water. It's very good. Thanks for watching and see you next time on Disney Channel. Thank you, Sophie and the Carsons. Safe, clean drinking water is truly a blessing. I don't think that it's an accident that our early ancestors chose to use water in baptism. Water connects us. It gives us life. In many ways, the colonial church is a community of water. And water is meant to flow. It's a blessing that is meant to flow. And each week, we continue our work together to make that happen. And so we take offerings to continue our work together. And here's how you can make an offering to support us right now. Will you join me in a prayer for God's blessings on what we have to offer? Creating one? You named all that has come into being, skies and planets, oceans and dry land. Your creating spirit is honored as we live with integrity toward all life. Shape our lives to be stewards in your image, that all may be safe and nurtured under our watchful care. In the name of Jesus Christ, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit for all eternity. Amen. Being able to pray for one another this past year has been so important. Prayer is a powerful way to stay connected even when you're apart. Today, as is our custom, we offer the prayers that people in this church community have asked to be prayed today. And after each prayer, I will say, Lord, in your mercy. And can you, from wherever you are right now, pray here our prayer. Jim Matson's body died last weekend. 
He and Carlo were in St. Louis, and as we pray that God's Holy Spirit be with them as a comfort, as they mourn, just know that we are going to be coming together in the weeks ahead to honor his life and his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Tom and Francis Cochran, their first baby arrived just a little over a week ago. Cecilia Louise Cochran and her mom, they're doing fine, along with the new grandparents, Cindy and George Lafferty. We thank God for this wonderful sign of hope with new life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our church community's last founding member and our last World War II veteran, Dorothy Mulford, is coming to the end of her life. As she put it, she has a date with Lynn to make. Let's hold her close to God and ask for death to be gentle as she passes from life into life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Following the verdict in the Chavin trial in Minneapolis, we pray that this is a healthy step, step toward racial justice in our nation. By God's compassionate guidance, may we continue this important conversation and the work that needs to be done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In our community's continuing prayers, still in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, we thank God for those healthcare workers, scientists, researchers, and for all of you teachers out there that have done so much in the name of love this year. May God's spirit be with you always. As we experience an epidemic of gun violence in our nation, we pray for God's Holy Spirit to empower us to change this broken world and end the needless deaths caused by this plague. And we pray for caregivers and for those living with dementia. May they receive the respect and the love that they deserve. And we pray for anyone who is living in the shadow of mental illness or depression, and we ask for God's light of hope to break in and shine. And for those immigrants and refugees who are far from the land they knew, we ask for safety and compassion to come from Christ Church. And for the loved ones in our lives who are with cancer and other ongoing life-threatening conditions, we pray. For Art Foster, Ken Wernie, James Fuller, Sean Bolter, Lisa Lucas, Ding Keeney, Karen Fogelsong, Kathy Hellwedge, Logan Lowry, Andrew Wood, Nathan Green, Max Ross, Clive Griffiths, Cindy Russell, Gwen Toll, and Edith Guffey. May God's strength flow from our prayers to them. God's kingdom here on earth needs some love in many ways. In this Earth Day week, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Next Sunday at 1015, we will have a, our first live in-person Sunday worship service inside our holy space here in over a year. Our worship service will continue to be online as well, coming together live both at 8.30 or at 10.15. And as we heard a baptism story this week, we'll be celebrating a baptism next Sunday at our 10.15 service. And we've got a few more weeks before recording our Jerusalem dance. And at the end of our service, we're gonna be doing a quick practice together today. So get yourself loosened up and ready to dance. This church community continues our dance together in Christian love each week. We make promises to continue that. And if you're not at a point in your life where you feel like you can make this promise, this covenant together with us, that's perfectly fine. Please receive then these words as a blessing and also a prayer that someday you will join us. We covenant with the Lord and with one another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in Christian love. We seek to worship God in spirit and in truth and to love our neighbors as ourselves. With God's help, we will honor Colonial Church and our conduct, support its program, and extend the influence of Christ throughout the world. Our time of worship is now over. But our service to be a blessing, that continues now. So go in peace and live passionately and love faithfully and celebrate. Celebrate every moment of life you have from now until your life's finale. Because our God of resurrecting grace goes with you and in you always. Amen.